OK. So let's also then talk about vectors. What would I contrast a vector with? We have vectors, and then we have, anybody? Scalars? So no? OK. Vectors versus scalars. Here's the deal. A scalar is different than a vector in that a vector has direction associated with it. So a vector has both a magnitude and a direction associated with it. What do I mean when I say magnitude? Just a number, yeah, an amount, a number, a numerical value. Notice if I said, what was the magnitude of, you know, the earthquake in Japan earlier this year? You're going to give me a number. So when we say magnitude, it just means the amount, the number, the numerical value of something. But what makes it a vector is not that it just has a numerical value, but that it points a particular direction. So notice, we'll talk about, you know, the difference between speed and velocity in a little bit. And speed, just how fast you're going. But velocity is a vector, and it's how fast you're going and what direction. Are you going to the left, to the right, up, down, forward, backward, north, south, east, west? Those are directions you might see. Or at certain angles above the x-axis, things of this sort so on and so forth. But vectors have magnitude and direction, whereas a scalar quantity just has magnitude, but it does not have direction. And so, again, velocity is a vector because it has both, but speed, as we'll see, only has magnitude, and so it's just a scalar. Cool, this will get important for how we add vectors in a little bit. Um, cool, so let's look at a vector here for a little bit. We'll do most of this stuff on your typical Cartesian coordinate system with the horizontal axis like the x-axis and the vertical axis like the y-axis. So let's say I have a vector here. So, and this vector is anything that has both magnitude and direction. So, and one of those we have is what we call displacement. And I'm going to say that this thing is 10 meters. So, and it points 30 degrees above the x-axis. 30 degrees above the x-axis. So we're going to do a little bit of a trig review here. So, essentially this is a displacement. So this lovely vector right here. So, and essentially you are moving a certain distance and a particular direction. So it has both magnitude and direction. It's a vector. So in this case, we often break this up into what we call x and y components. You could start from the origin and walk out to this point right here. But the other way you could potentially do the same displacement is to walk so far in the x direction and then to walk so far in the y direction. Or vice versa. You could have walked in the y direction first and then in the x direction. And it's these specific things that are in perfectly in the x direction and perfectly in the y direction that we call the x and y components of this vector. What kind of triangle did we end up forming, forming by doing this? Yeah, that's a right triangle. And so what theorem do we often use in conjunction with right triangles? Pythagorean theorem. And that's what we're going to do here as well. The x component squared plus the y component squared will equal this as the hypotenuse here, the vector squared. We'll see that coming up here in a little bit as well. So in fact, I'll write that in a sec. So we're also going to, also going to use some of your trigonometric identities. So what are your big trigonometric identities. Sine, cosine, and? And tangent. We'll actually end up using all three in some way, shape, or form. What's Sokotoa mean? So what's cosine? So, and tangent. Cool. We'll end up using all three of these at some point in time. So let's take a look here. So this is going to be our x component here, and this is going to be our y component. Let's take a look first at our y component. So relative to the angle defined here is 30 degrees, this side is which side? Well, which in terms of Sokotoa? It's the opposite side. It shows up in both sine and tangent. But what other side do we already know the value of? The hypotenuse. So which identity should I use if I want to find what this opposite side here is equal to? Yeah, sine. To rearrange this a little bit, you get sine, in this case, of 30 degrees is equal to the opposite side, which I'm going to call our y component here. 
all over the hypotenuse. What's our hypotenuse? 10 meters. If you rearrange this a little bit, your y component is equal to 10 meters times sine of 30 degrees. Cool, we can do something similar to figure out the adjacent side here. What identity will I use to figure out what the value of the adjacent side is? Cosine. So we, we know the, we can calculate the cosine of 30 degrees. We still know the hypotenuse is 10. The only thing we don't know is the adjacent. So and if we do the same thing, cosine of 30 degrees equals x. Now it's the x side that's the adjacent side over 10 meters. And so here x is equal to 10 meters times cosine of 30. Cool. The way it usually works, so in generic sense, is that your y component of a vector here, which I'll just call vy, if you will, it's equal to the value of v, the magnitude of v, times sine theta. So if I have vx, the x component of a particular vector, that's going to equal the magnitude v times cosine theta. So we derived it from our definitions of sine and cosine, but this is something you want to take away with you. You just take the magnitude of your vector and multiply by either the sine or the cosine of the angle. Now here we got to be really, really careful. If you're going to use always using sine for the y component and cosine for the x component, then you've got to be careful at how your angle is defined. The angle always, 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 always will be the angle with respect to the x-axis, not the y-axis. Notice this angle with respect to the x-axis is 30 degrees. What is the angle with respect to the y-axis? It's 60 degrees. But as we've defined it, so we've defined it with respect to the x-axis like this. If we switch to using the angle with respect to the y-axis, we'd have to switch our components of who uses sine and who uses cosine. So, but as a standard, Almost always we teach you to do this in terms of the x-axis. So what if I gave you this angle instead? I told you this was 60. What would be a good idea to do? Still use this one here. Rather than having to visualize the triangle, which you should be able to do, but it's a little faster if instead of having to visualize the triangle and figuring out who's opposite and adjacent, if you can be like, that's 60, that's not the angle I need. I need the 31, because that's with respect to the x-axis. That way I can just be like the y component, is the vector times sine, sine theta. The x component is the vector times cosine theta. Cool. One thing to note, if I wasn't using degrees, what, would I, what might I be using? Radians. Over the course of physics, you're going to use both. Make sure your calculator mode is set accordingly, depending on what you're using, because you'll get the wrong answer if you don't have the right mode. So FYI, word of the wise. OK. So let's actually put a numerical value here. What is 10 times sine 30? Sweet. And what is 10 cosine 30? Eight point seven. Sweet. There you go. Notice I use 30 degrees because I happen to know the sine and cosine of 30, but obviously if I would have picked 28 degrees, I would have said, please use your calculator and tell me what that comes out to, because I would definitely not have known. Cool. So I just took a vector that we already had, and I broke it down into x and y components. We found out the x component was, again, 8.7 meters, and the y component was 5 meters. And so we find out that this vector of 10 meters, 30 degrees above the x-axis, is exactly the same as if we'd just gone 8.7 meters in the x direction, followed by 5 meters in the y direction. Totally the same thing. I could walk directly there in a straight line if I was walking this, if you will, or I could have walked this way and then this way, but the net result, where I started, where I ended, would have been exactly the same. The reason we often break vectors apart into x and y components, one, it's a matter of convenience. So because when we add and subtract vectors, that's usually the process. You break it into components, and everything that's in the x direction, you can add together. And everything that's in the y direction, you can add together. But then you can assemble the vector back. So let's pretend for a minute that I didn't know that this vector was 10 meters, 30 degrees above the x-axis. Let's work this backwards. Let's just say I had given you these two components, and I wanted you to find out what the total vector sum was. Well, how would you find the magnitude? 
how would you find out that it really was 10 meters? What would you, what would you use? Good, and that's the Pythagorean theorem. And so in this case, our vector would come out equaling the square root of 5 squared plus 8.7 squared, just using the Pythagorean theorem. And in the end, we would get 10. So it's just Pythagorean theorem. We've got both legs of the right triangle, and we need the hypotenuse. So square them, add them together, and then take the square root for the whole a squared plus b squared equals c squared, if you will. Cool. Now the angle. If I, if I, again, it, only the x and y components were given. How would we get that 30 degrees? That's actually what we'd use tangent theta for. So in this case, the tangent deals with opposite and adjacent. So if you had the opposite side and the adjacent side, so in this case, your tangent theta would reduce down to tangent theta equals y over x. If we always define theta with respect to the x-axis, then the opposite side will be the y component, and the adjacent side would be the x component. And so here, we'd have tangent theta equals 5 over 8.7, and theta would equal the inverse tangent of that. And can somebody humor me and just for the fun of it, solve for theta here for me, using the trig identity there, the inverse tangent? We should already know what it's going to come out to, but just for the fun of it. Yeah, 29.9. I rounded when we rounded at 8.7. But for all intents and purposes, it's about 30 degrees. Spits it right back out. Cool. You're going to have to do this in your sleep by the end of the semester. And you'll use it again all next semester. So when we start dealing with two-dimensional problems, problems that are not only in the x and not only in the y, but often somewhere out in between, you got to do this in your sleep. you got to be able to take a vector and break it up into its components. Or you might have to take these components and assemble it back into a vector. And if, again, you're assembling it back into a vector, you got to get two things to make it a vector. What are those two things again? The magnitude and? the direction, in this case, 30 degrees above the x-axis. So you've got to get both those. Everybody cool with this? Cool. Let's add a couple of vectors together. So let's say you had this same vector. That was 10 meters, 30 degrees above the x-axis. So and let's just call that A. And we usually signify a vector. There's a couple of different notations for it. So, but oftentimes, we we'll just put an arrow above whatever variable it is. That signifies it's a vector. Well, I could have seen it was a vector anyways. It's got both magnitude and direction. And let's say I have another vector, vector b. And let's just say it's equal to 5 meters in the positive y direction. 5 meters in the positive y direction. And the question is, what is a plus b, the resultant vector we often say when we add or subtract vectors? What's the resultant vector equal to? And so my answer should reflect having both x and y. Com uh, I'm sorry, our resultant vector should have both magnitude and direction. Cool, so adding and subtracting vectors. If they're all in the x and y direction, life is so good because they're really easy to add. This one's all in the y direction. And I look at that, and I'm like, sweet, that's awesome. But I see this guy, and I'm like, Dang it. It's in both x and y directions, and that kind of sucks. So what we usually do in this case, to get a plus b, one, you might want to diagram it so you can kind of see what's going on. So in this case, when you're adding them, it doesn't really matter if you do a plus b or b plus a, you get the same answer. So but in this case, b again was 10 meters, 30 degrees above the x-axis. b, on the other hand, is 5 meters in the positive y direction, so straight up in this case. My resultant vector, so we kind of add them in a tip to tail fashion. My resultant vector is then where I started and where I ended up. Cool, and so that's kind of diagram. This vector in black is a plus b, and that's what we're going to actually try and solve for in this case. Cool, so what I usually do for something like this is I'll take vector A and I'll take vector B 
and I'll split it into X and Y components and make a nice little nifty table. So, and because we already figured this out, I'm going to take advantage of that. It'll kind of streamline the process. So but let's do B first. What is the X component of B? Of vector B. What is the X component? Zero. It's in the perfectly in the Y direction. There is no X component. So its X component is zero, and its Y component is all of it. So that one's easy. That's why when a vector is all in the X or all in the Y, breaking it to components is really simple. There's no like sines and cosines or anything to worry about. However, if it's not the case, like here, we're going to have to break this into X and Y components. Because this is the same vector we used a minute ago, I'm going to take advantage that we already know these. What was the X component? 8.7 meters. What's the Y component? 5 meters. So from here then, We'll make a column for A plus B. The X component of A plus B, well, just add the X components of A and B. And so in this case, we're going to get 8.7 meters for the X component. What's the Y component going to be? 10 meters. Cool. So now I have the X and Y components. How do I assemble this back up into a vector? So how do we get the magnitude? Use what? Pythagorean theorem. So in this case, notice this is the equivalent. This vector right here is the equivalent of having gone over 8.7 meters and then having gone up a grand total of 10 meters. That's our resultant vector. And so that makes, again, a perfect right triangle. And we can use the Pythagorean theorem to get that hypotenuse again. Can somebody calculate that out for me? So in this case, my magnitude of A plus B is going to equal the square root of 8.7 meters squared plus 10 meters squared. And that's in meters. Cool. So we use the Pythagorean theorem to always get the magnitude from the components. How do, what do I use to get the direction? Inverse tangent. And so in this case, so your angle is the inverse tangent of what over what again? Y over X. So 10 over 8.7. Can somebody get me an angle in degrees from that? One more time. Cool, 48.98 degrees. OK. Now, technically, we should probably be worrying about what? Always in physics. Sig figs. So and I haven't done too much with sig figs here. So let's do a couple things here just to make this a little more interesting problem. So let's make that 10.0 meters and make that 5.0 meters, just to make this a little more interesting problem. So with these starting numbers, since we've done a lot of multiplication and division here, how many sig figs should my final answer have here for the magnitude? So it should have two. He's got three, he's got two. My sig figs and my answer should have the least of the numbers when we multiply or divide. So just two. So what am I going to round this to? Yeah, we're just going to round it down to 13 meters. So same thing with the angle. What am I round the angle to? 49 degrees. And so here we find out that our resultant vector A plus B is 13 meters. 49 degrees. Is 49 degrees enough? Well, that 49 degrees here is relative to what? The x-axis. So what do I say? And that's probably sufficient, but sometimes what they do is have us define relative above the positive x-axis. Because to the right, it's the positive x-axis. To the left would have been the negative x-axis. And yeah, it's technically above the positive x-axis in this case. Cool. And that is the sum of a plus b. 
What if instead we'd been trying to do A minus B? How would this be different? Well, instead of adding, I would have just subtracted the components instead, but it's still through components. A minus B is the same thing as A plus A negative B, but it's just A and then subtract, and I would have just ended up with different components in the end. Everything else would have been the same. What would that have looked like diagrammatically if I had A minus B instead? So, really? Are you sure? Uh, be careful. So if I'd had A minus B, I would have drawn A, but then instead of adding B, I would have gone the exact opposite direction there. So it turns out you said it would have been in quadrant four, but it actually is probably in this case going to end right up on the x-axis itself in this special case. So, but we'd have just gone down instead of up. Cool? Any questions about vectors? Like I said, you got to get really good at this, and you want to get to the point where this is just automatic. You do it in your sleep. You see a vector, so like the one we did before, and immediately you can break it down into x and y components using the sine and the cosine. So, or you have the components, and you can build them up, so right back into the resultant vector pretty quick. Again, if you have the components, what do you use to get the magnitude? Pythagorean theorem, what do you use to get the angle? Inverse tangent, awesome. So I still would have had A minus B. I would have gone out to A. But instead of going B, just flip it over and do the exact opposite. So instead of going up 5, I would have gone down 5. So it's kind of the same thing as A plus a negative B. And a negative B would have still been 0 for the x component, but negative 5 for the y component. Okay. 